Closed captioning of this program is made possible by the Fireman's Fund Foundation. It was a mostly peaceful general strike on Wednesday called by Occupy Oakland against corporate greed and the concentration of wealth, but it was marred by violence and vandalism by a few after midnight. The latest report on California's high-speed rail plan raises more concerns about its viability with a much higher price tag and a longer timeline for completion. Also, a close-up view of the engineering behind the retrofit of the aging system that carries water from Hetch Hetchy to the Bay Area. Coming up next. Good evening, I'm Belva Davis, and welcome to This Week in Northern California. Joining me tonight on our news panel are Michael Cabanaton, San Francisco Chronicle staff writer, Mina Kim, KQED news reporter, and Josh Richmond, Oakland Tribune, legal and political affairs reporter. Well, Oakland residents continue to clean up after Wednesday night's clash between demonstrators and police, as organizers of Occupy Oakland say the late night violence should not detract from what was largely a peaceful day of protest. began with speeches and songs at Frankagawa Plaza in downtown Oakland. An estimated 7,000 people took to the streets to voice their support of the general strike. The city did not shut down, but hundreds of teachers, nurses, city workers and others took the day off to join in the day of protest. I took a day off. This is a, a something I believe in beyond what you can imagine. And uh, I think that we, as Americans, need to stand up and work together and make this a greater country. And I feel like in the last probably 30 years, it's, uh, we've lost that. You know, all of us are regular people, and we just need to, we're coming together and saying, hey, you know, we don't, we don't appreciate uh, losing our jobs and getting them shipped out. Several businesses were shuttered, some in solidarity with the Occupy movement. We decided that we were going to close for business and not really focus on sales, but celebrate people coming together in a positive way. So we've had different DJs, just friends of mine who are coming because they're friends and they're in the movement and they're, you know, again, interested in supporting the community. This merchant decided to open his pizza shop after hungry protesters came by. I came down today because we want to kind of like wait, close down Oakland, but at the same time I got caught up trying to give me something to eat because I was lightheaded and I went over to my favorite place and he was letting me know that they were closed. So I support Oakland as well as I support the 99%, but we need to make sure we don't tear up our own city and make sure we can continue shopping and doing business in Oakland. Throughout the day, at least five businesses were vandalized, mostly banks. By early evening, thongs of demonstrators descended on the port of Oakland in what organizers said was an attempt to stop the flow of capital. Truck drivers who'd been lined up to pick up cargo turned their rigs around once it was clear that the port was closed. We are here and we're not going away. This movement is not going to go away. This isn't some blip. You know, this isn't some phenomena that will be gone. It's not a fad. These people are out here because they're upset. But in the late night hours, a group of demonstrators threw firebombs and lit bonfires in downtown Oakland. Police in riot gear, who hadn't been visible earlier, moved in and arrested more than 100 people. Well, Josh Richmond, you were there for 24 hours. What's your impression of what went on? 21 hours, <laughs> and my impression is that I was very tired after that. No, <laughs> it, it was, it was as we've said, a, a, an extremely large and generally peaceful protest during the day. 
Uh, there was some vandalism at, at several banks uh, and, and a couple of other places during the day. There were no police in downtown. There were no police at the Port of Oakland. And it was just a few, maybe 200 at most, uh, agitators who, who pretty obviously deliberately provoked a police response after midnight, first by breaking into and occupying and then defacing a, a piece of private property on 16th Street and then building barricades at either ends of that block and, and then eventually setting one of those barricades on fire. And th only then did the police give the, the dispersal orders and, and use the tear gas and, and start making arrests. So it, it, it is a crying shame by most accounts that, that the, uh, the, the, the frustration expressed peacefully by so many thousands of people was sort of in the end almost overshadowed perhaps by, by a few uh, uh, 200 people at most who, who had a very different message they wanted to convey. Was there a message that you received from being there? I meant what were your feelings after being with this crowd of thousands who'd come together around an, an unplanned agenda? Yeah, yes. and un, I think unplanned agenda is, is exactly it. You know, I think there, there is widespread frustration. I mean, this really was a, a cross-section of, of the community. It was every socioeconomic group, every age, every, every ethnicity, and uh, people are angry. People are angry at the income inequality. People are angry at the joblessness. People are angry at, at what they see as corporate profiteering. Um, but there doesn't seem to be a very clear consensus on what to do about it. You know, they're calling attention to it rather effectively, I think. But this, in terms of actual strategy going forward, there's still a lot of disagreement in question. Even, even after the, the vandalism the other night, we've seen some disagreement among people from the Occupy Oakland camp. Some of them say, this is not us. This is not the message we wanted to convey. We're better than this. We apologize. And, there, and then there were a few who were also saying, well, you know, people are frustrated. And this is what happens when people are frustrated. And, and, and some of them seem to expect some sort of special dispensation to express that frustration. The long and short of it is you can't, uh, you know, break into private property and then build fires in the streets and expect that there won't be a police response mm -hmm. to react to that. Mm -hmm. So. And also the way that it'll affect small businesses. I mean, was there some discussion about that as well? Because they're clearly part of the 99%, and yet, you know, it wasn't just uh, the Whole Foods and it wasn't just banks, but it was mom and pop shops that got lot, A lot of small businesses are getting trashed. And, and, and even before the vandalism, they're, they're losing business because people aren't coming down in, in numbers. Uh, the, the Oakland Metropolitan Chamber of Commerce was at the city council meeting last night, and uh, I understand they met with Mayor Juan today, they're starting a jobs not tents initiative, and the, uh, the the message is basically this has got to stop. This camp has got to go. Uh, you know, small businesses are suffering. Some are trying to break their lease to get out of the city because they're being you know ruined by by you know th these problems. And there's a lot of impatience, actually, from, from the local small business community about resolving this. But does the chamber offer anything other than that slogan? They, of, of uh, they, 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 they want that camp cleaned out. I know they yeah. do, but they said jobs, not camps. I'm well, saying, so do they offer the, the, some solution to I, I, jobs? I think, I think what they're saying is that there are jobs in these mom and pop stores that are going to leave or, or go away altogether if the businesses close or move away. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and they're saying that the city has to set its priorities. They're, they're not saying that there should not be demonstrations mm -hmm. by day, but they want the mayor to enforce what she has actually said uh, mm -hmm. since last week, which is there should not be overnight camping there. She's been saying that, but they want her to enforce it. Uh, on the other hand, there are members of city council and a lot of people in the community who believe that as long as they are, are nonviolent, the camper should be allowed to continue. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's, there's a lot of dissent within, within the city uh, elected officials uh, as well. Oh, well, we talked a lot about what happened the other mm -hmm. night, but I think the big question is what happens going forward. Mm -hmm. So Nina Kim, you, Nina Kim, you were there too throughout most of this. Have you had a chance to think about or hear from the organizers as to what's next? Yes, I th well, they're wrestling right now with this so-called black block or the black clad vandals. Um, and I think the extent to which they can sort of marginalize them and say that they were outsiders, that they were a splinter group, I think then it'll it'll help them maintain the popular support that they're they're getting right now. Because even without the vandalism, the the strike was pretty successful. I mean, you had thousands of people out there, and as Josh mentioned, a really broad cross-section. So if they're able to maintain this idea, even with the handful of people that are saying, you know, I think this 
was a legitimate expression of, of discontent, mm -hmm. if they're able to maintain this notion that they are a splinter group, then they might be able to maintain some of that momentum. Mm -hmm. So I think that's one of the first things that they need to, to try to deal with, and they are wrestling with that right now. Mm -hmm. um, I think the other question, which is what Josh raised, is the question of, well, you know, at what point, how can they maintain the momentum of the movement without specific uh, goals or demands right now? And I think it might be working for a while that this notion that it's about income inequality is, is attractive a broad base of support. But at the same time, um, they're going to need to think about where they want to take that and what kind of influence they want to have and whether they can build from the general strike as a result. Because the general strike didn't just give sort of props to Oakland. It, it also gave the movement some credibility that there, mm -hmm. there were so many people out there and that, that it was successful. Mm -hmm. And so, and, and part of the reason that it was successful was because labor came out in a mm -hmm. big way. Mm -hmm. I mean, the unions really mobilized. Teachers were out there. Even city workers were out there, right, in addition to the longshore workers and so forth. But were they out there? with permission from their jobs or were they out there on vacation? What were they out there on? Well, the way that labor worked it was actually because they knew that they could not strike or call a strike for their workers under contract, they would ask uh, management to give their workers permission to take the day off, whether it be to take a personal day if you were a teacher or to take vacation or unpaid uh, days off or paid days off actually for to participate in the strike. So, so they kind of worked it that way and um, and what's interesting is that I think the, the movement and labor will have to see if they can sort of build something from this. I mean, certainly the movement has something to gain if they decide that they want to strengthen their ties with labor. Mm -hmm. And what they have to gain is, is a link to, uh, to political the political parties, to, to Democrats and to Democratic uh, leaders. And, and through that process, they can influence policy. But labor also has a lot to gain. I mean, if labor can maintain this relationship, they've got allies, a, a huge uh, groundswell of allies behind their, their calls for, for greater income equality. Well, I think they've got to focus their message in, in a way that appeals to the 99% that they claim to represent. Now, a lot of the people out there really were that cross-section. They, they were all walks of life. But when you have a, a banner stretched all the way across the intersection that says death to capitalism and people out there essentially calling for a Marxist revolution, that's not something the 99 percent are really all going to get behind. Right. You know, so, I mean, is, yes. is there any kind of focusing going on that you we know, can and, see? You know, and this is a, de a definite concern. And, and some uh, experts I talked to this week said that, that the more far left politics is actually more of a threat to the movement than vandals, mm -hmm. right? Because you can easily mm -hmm. write off vandals. But, but the idea of, of ending capitalism, overthrowing the system, being very anti-government is not necessarily the ingredients to a popular movement, or, uh, to a broad base of popular support. Right. Before we move on, let's talk about the mayor, Jean Kwan. What's her future? You know, it is really uncertain right now. I mean, there is a recall effort underway for her. I think she tried to sound a little bit more uh, mayoral this week, but but she is being criticized by the police, which she already had a very thin relationship with, and they've really strongly come out against her. At the same time, her own city council members have been saying, you know, she's just letting this group take over. That And, and the, I think the biggest thing is that there's this concern about strain on city resources, uh -huh. you know, and, and whether she's just going to let uh, the Occupy movement continued to, to strain the city's well, lots budget. Lots of questions still in that story, both for the movement as well as for the city administrators that are trying to get their uh, understanding of where it's going. Absolutely. But there's also a lot of confusion, uh, Michael, about the story that you're covering, that's high-speed rail. I mean, we thought we had a program here we voted on, but now there are lots of questions. Oh, there are many questions. And the big thing this week was that uh, an updated business report, first one in three years, came out, and the cost estimate before was 43 billion. It's gone up to 98 billion. Um, that drew all the headlines, um, obvious for obvious reasons, but it also created a lot of sticker shock. You know, but the real news in the report isn't so much the uh, the accelerated cost estimate. It's the fact that they've decided to take a new approach. Um, First of all, and perhaps most important, is they're trying to be more honest and open. The High Speed Rail Authority over the past couple of years has gained this reputation, perhaps deserved, perhaps not, uh, that it's arrogant, that it has a plan that is going to ram down people's throats, and that we're doing it the right way, you don't know what you're talking about. Um, this plan, I think, is an effort to get around that. It's saying, look, we're going to lay all of our cards out. It's going to cost a lot more than we thought. We're going to build it in phases, not all at once. Um, 
ridership estimates will probably be lower and we're going to work with you. We're going to be more honest. The second part is, which is particularly important in the Bay Area, as they said, we're going to work with local commuter railroads. What they're going to basically do is their plan, the phases are, first phase is being built in the San Joaquin Valley from north of Bakersfield to north of Fresno, right where it makes a left turn and heads toward the Bay Area. Um, second thing they'll do, that should take about four to five years. Once that's completed, they decide either to go south to the San, Ju or the San Fernando Valley or north to San Jose. At that point, they connect to either Caltrain or the Metrolink commuter railroad. Um, people might have to transfer depending on uh, you know, the number of trains available, or they could run a few direct trains. Um, they also need to electrify both of those railroads in order to run high-speed trains, and that would be the next step that comes after that. And then the final phase would be building improvements. Uh, you know, this plan extends the construction period nine years. Mm -hmm. It's possible that high-speed trains could be running within 10 years, but they'd be going either between Fresno and Los Angeles or between Bakersfield and San Jose. And there's some state money that, that should be cut loose now, but there's some question about that, right? Uh, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of opposition that surfaced, in part because of this arrogant attitude or the perception of I an arrogant gonna attitude. I was going to say, just laying it all out really <laughs> quiet, the critics. Uh, you know, I, I think it uh, probably raises, brings in more critics. It certainly doesn't quiet the critics who say, how can we afford this? I, I mean, the reality is that they're not asking for any more money from taxpayers or directly from taxpayers. We passed a bond measure, uh, the state of California Proposition 1A, that raised $9.9 .9 billion for high-speed rail. Um, at this point, they're not counting on getting any more from state voters. They're not planning on going back. Uh, but they also don't have funding but, but, beyond this initial stretch. Don't some Republican legislators want them to go back to the voters? Uh, there are some who do, and you know, I, who knows what will happen with that. Um, there's some independent polling that's been done out there that shows that uh, you know, support, which was up in the 65, 66 percent range, mm -hmm. is now down closer to 50 percent. And when they start discussing uh, funding and the fact that it's kind of uncertain, it, it drops even more. The governor's more. still hanging in there, though. Uh, the governor is definitely behind this, and uh, his appointments to the High Speed Rail Authority Board kind of drove this change in direction. All right. <laughs> Excitement in California. <laughs> <laughs> and All we over. And we turn now to another major infrastructure project. The vast system that provides water from Hetch Hetchy to the Bay Area is undergoing a major retrofit as part of the first ever Bay Area Science Festival taking place this week. We present this look at the engineering behind this massive project by KQED's Quest series. From the peaks of California's High Sierra, the Tuolumne River springs to life. It tumbles thousands of feet into the Hetch Hetchy Valley, where a dam slows its mighty flow and pools its pristine waters for a thirsty population 167 miles to the west. If you're one of our two and a half million customers in the four counties that we serve, you're getting 85% of your water from Hetch Hetchy. And from there, it comes through a variety of pipelines across the Central Valley, and pipelines in the East Bay, and then there are pipelines around the South Bay and across the Bay that brings the water to our different customers. Five local reservoirs in Alameda and San Mateo counties supplement the system which delivers, by gravity, nearly 300 million gallons of water a day. For nearly 80 years, the San Francisco Public Utilities Commission has been making sure Bay Area taps flow with Hetch Hetchy water. Much of the system was built in the 1920s and 30s, spurred by the still fresh memory of a disaster that devastated San Francisco. The great earthquake and fire of 1906 really got the Hetch Hetchy project going. After the city burned, people could really see that there was a need for an assured and abundant supply of water in case something like that ever happened again. So that's really when the impetus to cre create the Hetch Hetchy system takes off. Despite opposition from Sierra Club founder John Muir and his supporters, in 1913, San Francisco won federal permission to flood the Hetch Hetchy Valley in Yosemite National Park. It then took San Francisco city engineer Michael O'Shaughnessy 
two decades to build the aqueduct. More than 80 years later, environmentalists continue to advocate for restoring the Hetch Hetchy Valley. In the meantime, an overhaul of the aging water system is currently underway. Because it crosses three active faults, there's a risk that a major earthquake could leave parts of the Bay Area without water for a month or longer. The Water System Improvement Program is a $4.6 billion program that will extend through 2016. It encompasses 81 projects, and one of the main goals of the program is to be able to deliver 265 million gallons of water per day to our customers within 24 hours of a major earthquake. It's one of the largest engineering projects in Bay Area history. In August, workers in Menlo Park began digging the first tunnel underneath San Francisco Bay. When it's finished in 2015, the $313 million five-mile tunnel will carry a new steel water pipeline and shield it from a magnitude 7.9 earthquake. It's uh, being installed in a clay layer of material that responds very, very well to uh, earthquake problems. Down in a layer that, that's not prone to react during an earthquake to liquefaction. Liquefaction occurs when the shaking from an earthquake causes waterlogged soil to behave like a liquid. A custom-built tunnel boring machine excavates the dirt like a giant cheese grater and erects the concrete line tunnel at the same time. This machine is unique in that it's an underground factory that's uh, 600 feet long. This underground factory consists of sections that trail the machine, sending out dirt and bringing in water, air, and 5,000-pound concrete segments. It eats dirt in the front and it extrudes concrete pipe. Finish tunnel. The concrete tunnel rings will come in two stacks, three high. The ring erector will erect those six rings one at a time, and then the machine will thrust off those rings when it moves forward the next time. The Lower Crystal Springs Dam in San Mateo County is also being upgraded, and the nearly 90-year-old Calaveras Dam in the East Bay is being rebuilt. The Hetch Hetchy system-wide improvements are being paid for by a 2002 bond measure passed by San Francisco voters. In addition to stealing the system against big earthquakes, the Hetch Hetchy Water System Improvement Program also enhances the quality of Hetch Hetchy drinking water. Hetch Hetchy water system is so incredibly clean, it's one of the few systems in the country that requires no filtration. It does get treated, however, by a chlorine process and also a brand new ultraviolet light process that we've just finished the construction of that plant in the last few months. But it's the rumbling threat of earthquakes that drives much of the innovative engineering and design evident in the retrofit work, especially along a busy corridor in the East Bay. We have four key pipelines that carry up to 95% of our water supply that cross the Hayward Fault in Fremont in Alameda County. And the last major earthquake on the Hayward Fault was in 1868. So an earthquake on that fault is not a matter of if, but when. So we had to come up with a very innovative uh, solution. We are going to be installing a 300-foot-long vault that includes multiple segments that are separated by a six-inch gap. It will allow the vault to deform without crushing the pipeline that will be inside. Then on both sides, we will install a ball joint. And a ball joint will allow the pipe to rotate up to 12 degrees. We will also install a slip joint. And what a slip joint does is it allows the pipe to slide more than nine feet. It's a challenge to keep the Hetch Hetchy system running while re-engineering it to last for future generations. And as the Bay Area grows, so does the need to protect the water the system carries, especially in a disaster. We've done a lot of things to improve building codes, to make sure buildings don't fall down, but all of that falls apart if there's no water. It would be a major economic problem for the entire Bay Area if our water systems failed in an earthquake and you could not get them back up and running quick enough to provide that service to people. 
Well, you can see a longer version of that story on Quest on Wednesday, November 9th at 7.30 p.m. right here on KQED Channel 9. And there's a web extra about the environmental controversy over Hetch Hetchy at kqed.org slash this week. I thank all of you for joining me here tonight and for, well, being Ex excellent simulating guest. <laughs> Next week we spend, we present Broken California, hosted by PBS NewsHour correspondent Spencer Michaels, on what can be done to solve the state's ongoing political gridlock. I'm Belva Davis. Thank you for watching. Good night. Major funding for Quest on This Week in Northern California is provided by the National Science Foundation and the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. Additional support is provided by the Richard and Rhoda Goldman Fund, the S.T. Bechtel Jr. Foundation, the Dirk and Charlene Cabsonell Foundation, the Vadez Family Foundation, and the Wincote Foundation. Support is also provided by...